Hi, I'm Stephen Perkins. You're not, but it's good to meet you. And welcome to the show. Pop culture addicts. You, me, and I'm in Jane's Addiction, so I've been an addict since I was about 14. I'm 54. Welcome to the show. Welcome to Pop Culture Addicts, the weekly show that brings you interviews and discussions with people in our pop culture world. You know, that means we get to talk more about movies, more music, more video games, and more. <laughs> Don't miss a week. You never know who's going to be our next guest. So, okay, addicts, are you ready for your pop culture fix? So, welcome to Pop Culture Addicts. Our guest today is Stephen Perkins. Now, you may know Stephen best for his time in bands such as Jane's Addiction, Porno for Pyros, but we also have him here today because I'm very interested in talking to him about his new project, which is called Halloween Jack. Now, we're very honored to have him with us here, so please won't you help us in welcoming Stephen Perkins. Thank you for joining us, Stephen. Hi. Hello, friends, new friends. So, Kathleen, nice to meet you. Where are you from? We are both from Michigan. I'm actually... Uh, north of the Saginaw area. Oh, wow. Okay. And I'm and, just north of Grand Rapids. You know, Jane's Addiction did our first show, I think, in 87 or 88. And we have a song called Jane Says, where we mentioned St. Andrews, which is a street in Los Angeles. But we were excited to share it back then with the audience. And they sang it with such gusto. I can still hear it. And this is like, you know, 1988. But uh, thanks for having me on the show. And um, so we found out there's a Halloween Jack in the UK. So we officially changed our name to The Halloween Jack. It's unbelievable. Now we own it. It's ours. The Halloween Jack. We went around a couple different ideas. And you don't want to know the, the ones we didn't get to. But, um, but you know, the, the thing is with Halloween Jack, The Halloween Jack, is about 10 years ago in Los Angeles, uh, the guitar player Gilby Clark. Yeah. He's player Daniel Schulman. And this great singer and guitar player, Eric Dover, we started playing, uh, I think, about every, every other week in Los Angeles at a place called the Dragonfly. And we would just do um, an hour of covers from Sweet, Alice Cooper, Elton, Kiss. I mean, it was it had punk rock energy. We would do some Iggy, some Dolls. But, of course, it was, um, you know, lacquered up with the glamorous side. And we added a lot of muscle to the versions that we do, you know, and that's right. what kinda, it was fun about what we did. We didn't replicate the original. We took the original, made it ours. And uh, when things kind of slowed down, I got on tour. I think Gilby left town, the bass player, it plays with garbage. Um, you know, what happened at that point, we just put it to bed. But about six months ago, the player from the New York Dolls passed away. Sylvain Sylvain. Yeah. And I thought, in a shower and I'm washing my hair not much of it and I said didn't we do a great version 10 years ago a recorded version of trash and so I called Gilby he said yeah actually he's got it so we did one of those wonderful pandemic zoom videos where each band member was in their own studio similar to this and mm -hmm. you can't mind or you know lip sync to the the track and our friend mark armontano edited it together with some slices of the dolls and we put it out as uh, just a, a kiss and a prayer to sylvan and the, and the whole family you know mm -hmm. and that sparked um, an interest in each other again let's do the jack let's 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 play halloween jack shows as soon as we're able and that's kind of how we kind of stirred the pot that was about six months ago all right. So um, there you go. That's the beginning of it. That's the tip of the iceberg. If you need more, we, you can ask, of course. Well, since we're already talking about it, I was going to ask you about this a little bit later off in the show, yeah. but I, let's let's go ahead and ask you this question yeah. now. So I'm always interested in backstories and where people get like the name of the bands from and, and all these things. So Halloween Jack, I'm assuming that that's in a, a David Bowie homage. That's uh, right. All right, cool. I, was, I thought it was either that or Nightmare, Nightmare Before Christmas, you know, Jack. No, Stone. it was the David Bowie, Diamond Dogs. Yep, and 74. Also we, I have another na band name, and you guys can use it. No one likes it, but it's from a Bowie song called Changes. Um, it took me years to figure out what he was saying, but the dead end street signs. Mm -hmm. He says that's one of the, the, the final words of the third, maybe the third line in the first verse or second verse, the dead okay. end street signs. 
he takes a turn into a dead end street sign. I thought that'd be a great name for a band, the dead end street signs. Everybody thinks it's a mouthful, but hey, what I mean. <laughs> so, but uh, yeah, so Halloween Jack to me is a band where you can embrace these songs that you grew up with. Love is like oxygen, which I know I, I remember 1977. I was probably like 10 years old, but I can hear it coming through my dad's car. He had a Cordoba. Okay. And um, those songs bring back memories, which kind of enlightens that feeling of anything's possible and rock and roll is made to have fun. And it also has a, it's got a message. The message is get away from your real job, do what you want as an artist, embrace it. That's why you are here. Someone else is here possibly to, uh, you know, if their dream is to be an architect, I hope they get there. If their dream is to be a baseball player and actually get to the majors, I hope they get there. But at eight years old, I found my drums and my dream at 13 at my bar mitzvah, 1980, I played a drum solo in front of all my school friends and family. And I've been practicing alone for three years at that time on pillows and pads. But when I saw what happened between me and the reaction of family and friends and even strangers and cancers and rabbis, I, uh, that kind of turned me into more of a, uh, an instrument, a tool to make people happy, okay. to make people move. It wasn't about look what I can do for the, you know, from 10 years old to 13, I was getting better at bouncing a drumstick, learning Van Halen songs. And that is important because you get better and you improve and you have goals. But when you see, when I saw people react to my playing and bodies move, and then also growing up in Los Angeles, we have uh, the Venice Beach Drum Circle every Sunday afternoon. And I was pretty okay. shy. I wouldn't join them, but you would hear, and people moving on the beach. And I was like 10 years old going, that's cool. I don't know what's going on. It smells kind of interesting too over there. <laughs> but, um, and so there's this tribal magnet that's coming out of me and drum circles and the recognition of rhythm in art, like MC Escher, who does the ducks, mm -hmm. white mm -hmm. and black, and recognizing shadows and, and the way you know, the world plays with rhythm. All this goes into my drum, I guess, trying to pull this drum energy, like I say, a tool. Be aware of earth and sea and people and conversation, and then hit them and get them to relax and move. If it's five minutes, five hours. That's what I can do best on this earth. And when I, you know, when you're in love, you know, nothing else matters, but it, it's hot and cold. Right. When you're a dad, hey, my kid's 11, he needs me less and less. You know, right. an infant, he needed me all the time. Now he wants me to back off. So, okay. So what am I? I am here as a dad, uh, a husband, a friend. Yes, yes. But the drums is what I think in a sense, puts me in a meditation and also is this electrifying, like the Tesla coil where he was brave enough to touch two coils in front of everybody and go, you don't die from it if they're alternating. And, you know, he, he was born, he, Tesla had a fever for three days where he went blacked out. When he came to, he had six or seven inventions in his head. Right. I don't know how it happened. Is he ahead of his time? Was he ahead of his time? Did something touch him? But sometimes when I'm playing, it's not what my hands and feet can do or what I think of. It's just letting go and letting those Tesla coils go through me and then seeing people moving. And then that's the energy like Tesla was showing the lights are on. I can make people's light go on. And, yeah. and that's, that's really, I think my journey, I'm not there yet. I'm a student of it all, but I'm, I'm open to it. And just like you see one of the, the, if Muhammad Ali inspires you or if, uh, you know, uh, uh, an astronaut inspires you. But when I, when I think about drumming, I think about Einstein meeting Bruce Lee. <laughs> really, really think about what you're doing, right? Really think about it all, that MC Escher fit in the puzzle. Yeah. But then, like Bruce Lee, just concentrate focus and and you know you walk into a room it's quiet 
when you start playing drums, it could be you're piercing the quietness, you're mm -hmm. breaking, you're violently mm -hmm. breaking the silence, and you're not a musician who gets to brush it like a strum or a chord. You have to make sense of this drum set. It could be quite violent, which is okay. It could be quite ge gentle and, and, and pillowy, you know, and soft. But it's really affecting the air in the room and the, and the feeling. And I practice a lot alone, but I get off with other people when they see and hear me. But I practice alone, so I'm, I'm good when I get in front of people. Sure. Makes yeah. sense. <laughs> so with your drum kit, I mean, your drum kit has to have evolved with you. I mean, that's just that's how musicians work. Yeah. So looking at some of the, the previous videos, your setup for Infectious Grooves in the video Punk It Up and Violent and Funky, compared to the kit that we see for the Halloween Jack. So do you ever look at your kit and think, oh no, that's not right. Or what if I change this? Or do you have it perfect now? No, man, everything's a change. It's almost like uh, going out to dinner. You eat three times a day, but what are you going to choose? So on a drum set, I think about who I'm playing with, what we're trying to achieve sonically, what kind of characters and flavors I can bring to it and might not be the right bullseye on the target every time. I might have thought, hmm, you know what? Next time I play with these cats, I'm going to bring this. But growing up, I wanted to play jazz because my favorite drummers were jazz players. They were so interesting and musical. <clears throat> But no one in my neighborhood had a piano or an upright bass or a saxophone. Everybody had to plug in their amps. So I became a more, I love jazz and swinging, but I had to add muscle and volume. So now you, you realize, okay, you're playing with a guy upright bass. You're going to change your cymbals. You need something quiet, something that doesn't take up too much real estate. Mm -hmm. You're going to put a big pillow in your bass drum so you don't have a a subsonic sound in the room that's going to swallow up his upright bass when he's trying to be musical and your kick drum's all, you know, pushing him out of the way. But you still want to play. You want to play. You want to hold back with your performance. So you you adjust the drum set accordingly so you can do your thing and not get in the way. It's all about real estate. It's about choices. And if you play a lot, you're taking a lot of real estate. That's okay. But then think about how to deliver the sound of your instrument. So all that... If it's very busy, fine. Make sure it fits in the in the mix. Because I now you think about a mix, a guy who mixes a record, he hears the vocals like straight ahead. He might hear cymbals up on the right top. He hears the bass line underneath his butt, you know, or his, his belly and while he's mixing, you know, and the guitars are shooting left and right. And it's an experience. Now, not everybody's gonna hear this great stereo experience when they hear the mix that you send them, but when you mix, it's 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 about making the real estate have events and not taking it all too much at one time and putting mm -hmm. it all in your face all at once. So it's in a, it's a story and drumming is really a, a, there's so many ways to go about it. You know, that's why I love Motown. You're not really part of the story. You're just laying in a pocket so people can move. Mm -hmm. And then you love jazz because they don't care if you're moving or tapping your foot. They're con conversing with each other. Right. And they, hope, they hope you're listening to what they're saying. And, you know, and I like punk rock, drumming because it's so uh, pure and so it, it, it's not sterile but it, they got everything out of the way they don't need that said they edited it you know there's no fat involved it's all you need and nothing else so i, I love taking and then of course african and latin and, and east indian rhythms and, and american indian rhythms and not trying to learn them correctly, just infusing it all like a, a new chef that, that's not going to try to do a traditional dish, but make something new. And it might not be the right thing for everyone's taste. And that's mm -hmm. good. I don't want to be a drummer for everyone's taste, though. It'd be nice to be. But, you know, if I, that's my advice to young musicians, old musicians, anybody, don't worry if people like you. Even though it feels good, like I said earlier, for people to like and move but it's not about my personality they like right. they hear my drumming and they start moving that makes that's i'm i'm just kind of moving the air and stabbing silence but i think like yeah. like you said it would be nice to be the drummer that everybody likes but i yeah. think that that's just the drum tracks and guitar band like 
Well, <laughs> you know the funny <laughs> so thing. Those is, are the guitars that everybody likes. I love. That, I love that. Yeah, but I love when people don't understand what you're doing, and that means you're not for everybody. And they, you know, the worst thing ever back in 1986 when Jane's Addiction was playing was getting good reviews from 40 year old men. Because why do they like us? These people shouldn't like us. <laughs> but they saw something and they heard something that was mature. And in and, and, and my opinion, the songs are still timeless. And they were timeless. From the moment they were written, it could have been today, tomorrow, or yesterday, or 100 years ago. They sound relevant lyrically and musically and mm -hmm. sonically. But I, I appreciate now that I'm 54 that a man at 40 or a... a a young, you know, 20 year old can see what James was doing back in 86 and, and agree upon it. Yeah. And, you know, I think about James addiction fan back there, they could have had a cure poster and a Metallica poster. And that would be a James addiction fan in 1986. Cause we were not afraid to put black lipstick on, but play metal. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so, you know, thinking about that, I mean, I was I was in high school in the 90s. I'm a child of the 90s. You know, I graduated from high school in 1995. And okay. hey, shut up, Kathleen. Nobody likes you. Uh, <laughs> you were three. She's a baby. Um, <laughs> we have a lot to learn from her. <laughs> we do, actually. I, I, I Now I admitted that on the camera. She's never going to let that go. Nope. But, you know, the thing is, is that uh, so, you know, growing up, I mean, I remember the first time I heard Jane's Addiction. I know my my buddy was like, "Hey, did you did you hear this band?" And for him, I mean, we I mean, we were I, I want to say I was in my early teens. I was 13, maybe 14 the first time I heard Jane's Addiction. And, you know, um, you know, he was more impressed with the album covers cuz there was naked women on it. And he's like, <laughs> "I have this thing, you know." Anyway, um, yeah. <laughs> you know, there's there's something about what Warner Brothers, the record label gave us was the opportunity to deliver that cover and our lyrics and they let us do what we wanted we had offers from capital and geffen and a bunch of labels but they were going to do something to us right Warner brothers said do what you want we want to show the world because at the time everything on, in, on the sunset strip was already signed up packaged and put out and i was young enough to see you know Motley and Rat and GNR even because they were around at the same time we were, but a little bit older than me. Um, everything was being, you know, in a similar category, but James Addiction was an after hours late night thing. And that's what we wanted to find a label that would let us do that on the art, mm -hmm. on the, on the, on the actual, you know, on the presentation of the band, no one got in the way. That's kind of cool because back then it was all, from what I remember, you know, I mean, that was the 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 like pinnacle of in the late 80s, the pinnacle of hair bands. And and, you know, for you guys to come out, you guys were, you know, uh, the complete opposite of what those guys were doing. And so you guys you, not that you stuck out like a sore thumb, but you guys did stick out. It, there was a noticeable difference between what you guys were doing and what these other bands were doing. And so when he played, he brought home nothing shocking and he played that for me. And I was like, well, this is really cool. You know, because my brother grew up and you know, he was listening to hair bands all the time. He was real big into like Rat and Poison and, you know, Motley and all those guys, because those were the bands of the of the time, you know, uh, and well, he, I'm 54. How old is your brother? Uh, let's see. I'm he's got to be he's 50, 51. Somewhere OK, around. yeah. So that's exactly what was going on. And on the East Coast, I'm not sure what was saturating, but the Pixies came out the same time Jane's did on the East Coast. And I think both of those bands it's not similar in sound, but no. in idea of how to make your own art and and not worry about what's happening around you. Right. Because it's, it has to be from the heart and you cannot be chasing something. And there was a lot of a lot of bands chasing something that another band made success on. And right. We didn't have that. And we weren't in my, you know, no. Well, that's one of the things I always loved about Jane's Addictions. One of the things I loved about the Pixies as well is that neither one of those bands was was worried about trying to fit in this pre-packaged pre-formulaic thing yeah. you guys were willing to be yourselves you guys were willing to present yourself as hey this is who we are this is our music this is what we're doing and for me that was a nice change of pace it wasn't the the same old same old. and, I've, and i think that's kind of what set the tone for me musically going forward 
for what I listened to and, and how, why I listened to certain things as I, as I got older and why I, I leaned into to certain bands heavier because they weren't the, you know, they may have had other people copy them, but they weren't, they weren't the ones going out and trying to follow the same yellow brick road that everybody else had already been going, going down. You know, and I love, you know, Tommy Lee is one of my heroes and I got to be in a band called methods of mayhem. So me and yes. Tommy Lee did double drumming and it was incredible. It was beautiful. But I think he was the the top of the, the of the pyramid when it comes to that rock and roll drumming. But mm-hmm. after Gene's Addiction, there were so many different types of drummers. There was Primus with Tim. There was the Pumpkins with Jimmy. Uh, the Pearl Jam had three or four different drummers. And you know, then you had, of course, I think his name was Dave Grohl from the Nirvana, and the guys that all worked together. And mm-hmm. you know, the whole movement that was coming, Matt Cameron, everything was coming out of Seattle was just had gusto and yeah. every drummer and then they you know danny carey from tool mm-hmm. and there were so many great drummers and it was like you know it, everyone had their own flavor yeah and it was a really cool time for musicians and i think especially in the the rhythm world and um you know jane's addiction and, and porner for pyros and of course you know when jane started there was fishbone records and chili pepper records and we were mm-hmm. doing gigs with them and um there was this sense that if you wanted to do it your own way, no one's going to stop you. Just don't be looking to chase somebody else's and ride, you know, their glory and maybe jump on their wave. So uh, I appreciate that. We made that, that punch into your world, you know, and then for what's going on in my life right now, I am starting a label called Perkins palace and I'm going to take all my experience and and all the friends and associates I've made that we made great music and art together. And I'm going to go look for new artists, whatever age. I want to awesome. help them get out there. And I know it's a, it's a strange world right now. We don't know what that means, get out there. But if I can just get a little more, if I can shine a light on anybody and help them, and I'm going to try. So Perkins Palace, I'm, I'm thinking it's possibly... Maybe at the end of the year, but definitely at the beginning of the new year, you'll see our first release. Awesome. And it's, it's really important for me to believe in it. I like rock and roll music. I like good players. I don't like, um, you know, uh, if I, I can't listen to it over and over and, and bite and keep chewing, I'm not going to enjoy sure. helping them. Mm-hmm. So that's it's exciting now because, you know, drumming, I could do it every night of my life forever. But it's hard to get, you know, of course, COVID has just changed everything, but it's hard to get a band that all wants to do the same thing at the same time. Do you right. all want to tour every summer? Maybe. Do you, do you see bands that do it? And it's pretty impressive because it's a real business to them. But sure, I, um, I'm enjoying the, like everybody, It's it was so derailing to have this terrible 18, 19, 20 months and who knows what's ahead. Right. But you figure out what you is important and maybe what isn't. You uh, you filter out the noise that, you know, there was been so much of it. You get it out of there. And uh, I think it's going to be a great creative time. And, you know, if there's a lot of great novels and films and musicians and artists bursting because of what we've been through, I can't wait to see what they're going to do. Oh, exactly. You know? I, I think everybody's been so penned up that, they, you know, they're. They're, you're starting to see those creative juices that they that they had to keep restrained for so long. They're yeah. starting to burst out right now, and things are things are starting to kind of break free again. And you're seeing, you know, uh, screenplays getting turned into movies. You're hearing about this left and right. You're hearing about new bands hitting the airwaves, mm-hmm. and, and all these all exactly. these different artists, you know, coming to, coming through because now they're able to do something with it. So I think that's really cool. And actually, I subscribed to your uh, YouTube channel today as I was watching uh, Trash. Uh, well, okay, good. Well, and, you know. Uh, you can see that the band has a good time playing these tunes and you oh, yeah. start to remember what a great band the New York dolls was. When you hear that song, mm-hmm. damn, that's a good song. And <laughs> also with the, the, I mean, I guess the hope that Jack can get to work is it feels good to, to think about getting together with those guys, getting on stage and just making noise with our toys. And, uh, and like everything else in this world, that hour on stage 
it's it's happiness is a, is a cloud, right? It just floats by. Right. And so I'm just looking for more clouds of happiness to get my life, you know, I want to get cloudy with happiness because <laughs> it's really important to add these great, you know, moments where you're surrounded by people making music and people are happy. And that's what you do for a living. And you don't get to do that a lot. You, you start to like shrink. Mm -hmm. That's you really want to do that for people. When you're and supposed to be on stage, you're supposed to yeah, be on stage. Yeah. Sometimes I feel like a basketball player that just does free throws all day at the gym, but never gets to <laughs> the game. You know, there's no game, man. Damn it. Oh, that's awesome. So uh, you mentioned the, uh, the band earlier, so I, wanted, I want to talk to you about them real quick. So back in 1996, when Porno for Pyro's released Good God's Urge, uh, I had just graduated from high school. And this, I love that album, by the way. Uh, Thank you. Tahitian Moon and Kimberly Austin mm -hmm. get played on the regular at my house. That's kind That's of cool. those. Those are kind of in the the regular rotation. Those make it into uh, trip mixes for cars, and you know when I'm out on the road, long travel and all that stuff. So I was always a big fan of Porno for Pyros. I, I, you know, I didn't see them as an extension of Jane's Addiction. I saw them as a different band because they were Thank totally you. different vibes. Um, uh, even though it had you on the drums and Perry, and you know at the mic. You know, uh, that was the only thing that to me that was the same as, as Jane's. Um, but I did read somewhere recently, and I'm hoping this is true. So maybe you can clarify this for me. I heard that there's a possibility that Porno for Pyros will be reforming and putting out a new album. Is that true? Well, we just did three Jane shows last week, and that was incredible. And I got to see our friend Eileen. But um, me and Perry, of course, love the music. And me and Pete DeStefano, the guitar player, mm -hmm. have another band called Hell Ride, which is does Stooges covers with Mike Watt on bass. So me and Pete see each other quite often. But there's a lot of porno, I guess you can say, unfinished business. So I, I would like to like, I I like like finish that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <I would laughs> business, you know, we've got songs, we've got ideas. And I think it's it's time. And there's and there's definitely that urgency how this world is moving so quick. This year's already cooked. Oh, yeah. And like, I mean, okay. Now we're in the next year's around the corner. And I, I am a big fan of, you know, what's happening in the next three months in, in the spiritual world of having a 12-year-old. He's going to be 12 in December. Of course, there's Halloween and Thanksgiving and Hanukkah and Christmas and his birthday's in December and New Year's. I like all those celebrations. And it gives me a chance to play music. But um, it's going to be exciting to start a new year and look at Jan 1 and say, January 1, what's, what are we going to do? And I would love to get Porno on that list. Awesome. Let's get to work and, and Jane's and mm -hmm. the Jack and everything because, you know, I, I think I have time for it and the energy and the, and the love to do it. And that's what you need. You need to love to do it. But, say, yeah, I think that's probably the most important part right there is the love. You know, there's Porno tunes and there's friendships. And you put those together, there's a future, you know. And well, uh, I also think the at, at Good God's Urge record for me the the highlight because of when we made it was a song called Porpoise Head. It's the first yeah. song on the record. Mm -hmm. But the band Love and Rockets, who they, that's basically Bauhaus without Peter Murphy. Mm -hmm. So you have David J on bass, Kevin Haskins on drums, and uh, Danny Ash on guitar. They came up to the studio. And we made Porpoise Head together. So it's really Love and Rockets and Porno together on that track. Oh, that's cool. And that track to me is really the, the step forward sonically because we were so give and take. We really listened to everyone. There's so much room for each other, but there's six people on the song. And also the memory of hanging out with the guys for two days, making a song with some of my heroes. So um, if you haven't checked out Porpoise Head in a while, take a listen. I like to trip out on it. I think it's one of the coolest ones. Oh, I'll be listening to that as soon as uh, as soon as we're done here today, just to kind of go <laughs> back and because cool. so we have another uh, podcast that Kathleen and I do together called the Funny Science Fiction Podcast, and one of the things I love about that show because I'm a I'm a big sci-fi nerd. I love Star Great. Wars and stuff like that. Good. Uh, and, and so you know we have people come on and and it's stuff that I'm not exactly a fan of or that you know I didn't see in a certain way. People say, well, watch it from this perspective. And mm -hmm. that adds so much to it because now I'm able to see it or hear it from somebody else's perspective. And so I'm going to go do that now 
uh, well, not right now, but yeah. now with uh, Porpoise uh, head, and I'll go back check that out and and say, yeah, okay, man. well, this is what this this is what Stephen was saying earlier. I'm gonna go listen to it from that perspective. So There's, that's yeah. Pete DeStefano does the real pretty guitar picking. Danny Ash is doing the incredible sound effects. I'm playing drums and timpanis. Kevin, who is just an incredible his ears as a drummer are so fine tuned. He picked out all these electric sounds and played electric pads. And then we had David J on bass, which was this real like sweeping, like it's like a, a feather floating mm -hmm. his bass line. And then, and Perry's lyrics, it's superb. So uh, that's yeah. Porpoise head. And yeah, so Kathleen, what do you, what do you, do you play an instrument or what do you do besides like hang out with this man? <laughs> so <laughs> I, I, play piano but not frequently i'm actually a vocalist okay. i was Ooh. i was in choir from third grade through my senior year my mom um my mom actually plays in an adult wind band so she's a percussionist in an adult wind band that's I, fantastic yeah my grandmother was a classically trained opera singer so i've got a lot of music in me it's just the majority of it is currently used for Twinkle, twinkle, little star, and row, row, row your boat because I have a three year old. <laughs> well, that's important because you got to have chops to do that, and they want it done right. And you know, oh, and, yeah. and you got to do it. Now, I've been reading some, like, when I, excuse me, when I read with my son, I try to take on these characters. He's like, Dad, just read it. I'm like, no, I got to be, I want to be voices. Well, you have I, can't, to act it. I can't, yeah, I can't read really without that, you know. But um, so when you grew up, what did you listen to, opera or, or, what? Um, a little bit of everything. My, my dad was older. My dad was 47 when I was born. Um, okay. my older siblings are 12, 10 and four years older than me. So I was kind of an afterthought. Um, well, I was 44 when my son was born. <laughs> I mean, my parents tried to tell me that I was the only one of them that was actually the only one of my siblings that was actually planned, but I think that was to try to make me feel better. <laughs> but we listened to everything from Simon and Garfunkel, um, mm. My dad loved Simon and Garfunkel and Beach Boys and Jimmy Buffett. But then with my brothers being older than me, they got me into Jane's Addiction and Bowling for Soup and Three Days Grace. <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah. So a little bit of everything. A little yeah. Bit you know, when yeah, I, I had an older brother and I went through his records and picked out what I liked. And then he would give me the stuff that he thought I missed out on. And he's like, mm -hmm. oh, you missed this. And, and uh, it really helped me find... I guess the how broad way to look at music, and he yeah. he did have a taste of this and that and the other. But when I became a drummer, I got so hungry and I searched out the strange rhythms. And sometimes mm -hmm. it wasn't even the music that I liked. I wanted to hear what the drummers were doing, and and I I had that fascination with hardcore metal. I love what's happening, it, the, the technique of the metal drummers and. When I was young, Iron Maiden and and you know Slayer and, and some of the the thrash metal bands were doing something, you know that was progressive in a sense, but still with a lot of punk rock mm -hmm. energy. And then I fell out of it, and then all of a sudden Pantera showed up, 1991 or 92, whatever it was, and I got excited again about metal. And I think about the two brothers that are gone; they're not here anymore, Dimebag and and Vinnie Paul. Yeah, and it's incredible that. They're like shooting stars, and especially out of Texas, these guys were just wild. You know, mm -hmm. they were big barbecues backstage. They were just party all night. They were Texas, and their music was. And you know, you think about musicians that hit it and quit it, and the world just kind of, you know, it gets a. It's like a, a meteor, bam, and it's dented. There's a huge imprint. And then, you, like the bands you mentioned, I love Simon and Garfunkel too. Those guys are still alive, and they yeah. could be playing gigs together. <laughs> you, know, but, you know, and it's 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 a wonderful thing when um, you're there for a long time and you make this huge imprint over and over, or even a short time like these cats. And I was very fortunate. That's why I'm telling the story. Two three days ago, when James played, Wolfgang Van Halen was there oh. and the with Wolfgang, and to think about how important music is. And to everybody, and mm -hmm. then to stick out in the into the in and have a name that blows doors open for everything. Eddie Van Halen changed everything, and to have that happen is kind of like Tesla. How does it happen? Right, you have to be completely open to the experience. And it was great to meet Wolfgang because the DNA is there. 
he shares DNA with Eddie and Eddie right. he knew where his, and you know, you got to wonder, maybe Eddie had some Tesla DNA. So that's where I'm going. I'm going to find out. He definitely there you go. <laughs> hey there. <laughs> See, and it, you, when you mentioned jazz earlier, I got excited. My mom and I were in a jazz group together for three or four years. I was secondary vocalist. And then when the first vocalist left, I was the only vocalist, but my mom, it was, it was a lot of work. And yeah. I was so chorally trained that it was mm -hmm. the, wait, what? Yeah. I'm good. that's, that's gone. That is yeah. out. The window. out. And that was the thing is the, the friend of ours that plays upright bass for that. He's like, you see the notes? I'm like, yeah. He goes, ignore the notes. I'm like, but, but, that's what the notes are there for. He's like, it's a guideline, right? And then you right? can you can play around all the rules when you go to jazz. And the confidence there to pull it off too, because you know you have to have a good time with it, but you got to be quite serious. It's an art, and you don't want to you know just throw you know ink at the page and go eh, and rip it up and throw it away. No, it's your voice. It's your it's your reputation. It's you, and uh, and it's important because when I embrace a situation and I don't feel comfortable, mm -hmm. how do I pull it off with confidence and right. not hear hesitation, even the slightest hesitation? You know how? Because that'll ruin everything if you if you hesitate over and over the whole night. It doesn't. You're gonna hear it. You, you know? miss one beat. And <laughs> yeah, messes it's over. Up. Yeah, the because it's like the, the butterfly effect. Everything else mm -hmm. is just not. Ah. So I I really appreciate when musicians in the jazz world have that confidence to play around with with the the notes. Mm -hmm. And it's it's not just being good at your instrument; it's having ideas. Yeah. And that's and, and the confidence to say that this idea is going to work, and then to go yeah, for exactly. it. Exactly. And, and so I guess if it falls to pieces you keep going and you call it a jazz solo <laughs> yeah you know and the thing about classical musicians you know they can jam mm -hmm. but of course their job or even if they're working in an orchestra or symphony that's doing a soundtracks for a movie their job is to be exact and to follow dictation mm -hmm. and deliver from tempo little slight nudges in the tempo is up to the conductor not right. you you know, a little volume nudge that you think should be soft. He's looking at you going, it's louder here. And that's his opinion. But you're you're a tool for that. And, you know, you think about, a, a you know, I will never know what Beethoven or Mozart's exact tempo was. They they wrote moderate or, they you know, whatever they wrote on the top of their piece. But a conductor now peaks. A one conductor can do Beethoven's fifth in 18 minutes. The other one does it in 19 Right. Or 1840. Like, where's the extra 40 seconds? Mm -hmm. Well, he slows things down or he speeds things up. It's up to him. And I really enjoy that you can do that with jazz. It's hard to do it with classical music, but the conductor can. Right. You can get jazzy with Beethoven. I was like, really? Yeah. It's a, he's he's jamming it. <laughs> <laughs> so on that same sort of topic, drums are the foundation and bass is the heartbeat of every band. It's just, that's just Back. how it works. But you've had the opportunity to work with a lot of very talented bassists over your career from Eric Avery, Robert Trujillo, uh, Mike Watt, Daniel Schulman. Yes, my husband did the research because he's a bass player and he's like, he worked with these people. But <laughs> so do any of those stand out for you with somebody that you just clicked with instantly and you you felt the the groove between you and their bass playing well yeah you know, we don't want to forget rob Wasserman who passed away True. upright fretless uh tony franklin one of the great bass players who played with jimmy page in the firm i love playing with tony he fits me like a glove we don't want to forget mike watt flea les claypool i mean everyone is different but Eric Avery, since I met him when I was 17, and he wrote songs almost uh, like a melodic uh, acoustic guitar player on his bass. Mm -hmm. That gave me a chance to embrace an original side of me that maybe another bass player, I would, if I didn't meet someone like Eric at 17, who knows if I would embrace my original tribal you know, just follow my heart drumming. Don't replicate anybody else behind me or in front of me. Just do my thing. So Eric was the, probably the biggest influence on me by far. 
uh, playing with Tony Franklin now. He's on it. And it's like, oh, this feels okay. We're there. No problem. You know, playing with Flea. I did it about a year ago. Is I've done it a bunch. He was in Jane's Addiction in 1997. He is so fluid. Mm hmm. And you you can be the, the surfer on his wave or he'll surf your wave. That's a cool give and take, a wonderful give and take. Yeah. You know, and uh, Mike Watt from the Minutemen. He is a very melodic, beautiful bass player. He was on Good God's Urge, the song. He is so beautiful. Doo -doo -doo -doo. Doo -doo. And then on stage, he is a bull. He's just knocking stuff over and let's get to work. So there's two Mike Watts. And that's what I love playing with Mike. Um, everybody brings something to my bass drum. When I hear what they're doing on their bass, I have to think about, am I going to be, or can I be playful? Do I need to be a little more assertive? Is he playful? Then I'll just lay it down. If he's not playful, then I can play. And so, you know, I get these opportunities. It's like, Cool, I'm I'm on a bumpy road now. Oh, and now mm -hmm. I'm in a sand dune, and now I'm you know. So you really kind of just listen to what they're giving you, and they listen to you. And I think that's the the beautiful rhythm section. You 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 work together like that puzzle, like the MC Escher. Yeah. You know? Nice. But um, Les Claypool was uh, a, a long time ago, but we laid down something that was so linear that he made me play quite less. You know. Less of like Tarzan letting go of the rope and flying through the air recklessly. Mm -hmm. It was more about driving down the bullet train highway with him, you know. Da, 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 boom, da, da. So, I, it, and it's cool to have opportunities to let them influence your playing. And then the next day, think about what happened mm -hmm. and you go, hmm, that could be cool. I'm going to try that next time with another bass player, you know. <laughs> nice. So, Throughout the course of our, our conversation today, you've mentioned a lot of different, uh, you know, musicians' names and things like that. So I, it had me thinking the Halloween Jack about the Halloween Jack being a super group because you have people <laughs> from it really is. I mean, come on, you got people from Jane's Addiction, Guns N' Roses, Garbage, Jellyfish. You know, those are people from four different bands, and, and you're all coming together to do something awesome. Um, but I also think of this kind of like fantasy football if you could draft your own super group. Mm. So that you would have to somebody you would want to listen to who would be in that group and why? Well, my my dream is to play with Peter Gabriel. And I think he's got such a way of painting a picture with his words. And, and also, awesome. also, yeah. And also the delivery of of the production is it, it covers the whole globe. It, he's English. But you don't know where he's from or what 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 year he's from. And yeah. if I could work with Brian Eno, and mm -hmm. Brian now is is, is a, a music producer and a music maker. Uh, he was the, the keyboardist for Roxy Music back in the seventies, mm -hmm. but he made and of course produced great Bowie records, U two records, his record which mm -hmm. changed my life, which was called uh, uh, Tiger, Taking Tiger Mountain by Force or by Strategy. And if I can work with those two and let them just mold me, and I don't care if we have turntables, basses, guitars, <laughs> keyboards, just, just let's make some music together because I think that would just make me more aware of what I can and my strengths and my weaknesses. I would really just become quite aware of what I can I do this with the guys that changed the soundscapes for the last 40, 50 years. Mm -hmm. What am I going to bring to the table? That's what I'm excited about is what, what they can do to me. And, um, you know, and then if it was a rock and roll band, you know, I mean, there's so many great players that have guts and, and, and they tear. And I think that's exciting you know, for me, the best punk rock band, there's two of them. I think that the Bad Brains do it the best. And then the the purification of the fear record. If it, uh, Bad Brains and fear, if I can be in a band with any of those cats just for one <laughs> song and see if I can raise to the occasion, 
rise That'd to the awesome. occasion. And, you know, I think the the musicians of the, the new generation, I'm playing with a cat named Derek Day. He's 26. I call him the art bird because anything you give him, he turns into art and he flies with it. Nice. And here's an example. We were uh, in Warsaw for a three hour layover with the band Think Floyd or Think X. And everyone's like, you know, let's go get something to drink. I'm going to have a, you know, I'm going to read. I'm going to call my wife. Where'd Derek Day go? We couldn't find him. All of a sudden, this cat goes rolling by. He found a wheelchair, broke out his acoustic guitar, and starts f- doing flamenco Spanish songs and singing <laughs> to the, the old Polish people in Warsaw. And even the TSA guys with the with the machine guns are like, yeah, he's, he's pretty good, actually. <laughs> I was like, this is the kind of guy that makes art out of like a three-hour layover in Warsaw and entertained us all. And those are the kind of cats I want to find on this earth to turn me on because that's how I feel. Uh, if you have time on, on earth, what are you going to do with it? And I was trying to explain, and my son gets it, Time is relative. If you got a hot match at your finger for 10 seconds, it's going to take a long time. But if you're kissing your favorite person in the world on the lips for 10 seconds, it goes by quick. It's only 10 seconds either way. It's what you do with those 10 seconds. It's what you right. do with your 10 years and your 100 years. And so I'm trying to spend my time enjoying it. And, and yeah, when you're having fun, it goes by fast. Okay, cool. Let my life go by fast. But for many, many years, you know? <laughs> No, it's fantastic. <laughs> oh, goodness. This has been so much fun to talk to you. Like, oh, I'm cheers. Just, my brain is like reeling a little bit still. <laughs> it's been a blast. <laughs> so we can't just talk about the past. I mean, you've done a lot of really, really cool things with some really awesome bandmates. And you mentioned um, your your production company. Yeah. And potentially a Porno Papyros revamp. That's what else cool. you got coming? Well, let's, let's talk do. about it because to me, I think the drum world is ready for something exciting. I don't know what it is. So I'm, I'm ready to embrace. I, I think it would be great to do a, a, a find another drummer and who knows what it means and what it sounds like, but really find a way to do two drummers and make something that sounds like one and it's not too busy and it's powerful then f- add another musician or two. And one of my favorite keyboardists is Money Mark. Mm-hmm. And I would love to hand him a, a drum symphony, but it, it's, there's still room. Like I said, there's real estate, so you can't take it up all. Right. But I would love to have this incredibly musical freight train of drums and then add some interesting sounds and make that more of a, I guess, in a sense, an experience for a listener more than songs, more than, you know, something you can go, oh, that's my favorite part right there. No, it's like a chant, you know, it's, uh, it's tribal in, in source, mm-hmm. but also pulling from technology so we don't miss out on all the opportunities that that can deliver you know i mean i don't always think that a sub an 808 is going to work in a rock band but it does work for hip-hop and r&b because uh, the real estate's available you know so that's what i'm really want to be aware of is make a drum uh, a marriage of two drummers where we're both aware of the real estate of electronic, the hybrid of electronic uh, subs and, and tingly tops and acoustic natural drums, and then find someone and put a soundscape on that. That would be a creative uh, way to look at the next year. And then with, with the Perkins Palace label, my goal is to get three artists a year. That'd be wonderful because that, that'd be a lot of work and I don't want to miss any opportunity to do it correctly you know so i don't want to take on too much Mm -hmm. but it's a really a a goal of mine to become more interested in turning the rock over and looking at things differently and see if i can find something there that maybe i would have passed up not you know a business opportunity passed up on on a spiritual sense 
And I think now that I'm 54, what is not the second act, but what is shit? I'll go to 108. So what's the next 54? Let's go. Let's go there. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. What's the next chapter? Where are we going with this? <laughs> yeah, I'm halfway home. There you go, buddy. So I only have I only have one more question, and it just sure. came to me, just because I'm curious. What is your symbol brand? I'm a Zildjian uh, endorser, and I've got many different types of symbols back there and gongs. You know, the, all the companies make great sounds, and it's about relationships. Mm -hmm. I have a great relationship with Zildjian. I love the people that own it, run it. I was very fortunate to meet some of the real Zildjian family members. Oh, so older cats, cool. fat, yes, they've a, a lot of them passed on, but the, the Zildjian name lives there. And it's about not having every kind of buffer. I never had anybody call for me for my drums or cymbals or sticks. I called, hey, I'm a drummer. Here's my record. Mm -hmm. I love playing. And I don't want free stuff. I just want to play your stuff. And if right. something breaks, could I call you if I'm on tour and go, hey, I need another one because I don't want to buy somebody else's gear. Right. Or buy it from you guys. And then you start a relationship and you become part of their family. And I think even the drum world, some of the cats move from company to company as a drummer. And that's okay because a lot of the companies have employees that move from company to company. Right. So sure. it's like, you know, it's a, it, it's a small pool and it's pretty shallow of people swimming in there and playing. But um, I've been very fortunate to make friends and keep friends uh, in a sense that they want to hear their symbols on record and on stage. I want to give it to them. Mm -hmm. And it's a great friendship because we both want the same thing. Yeah. I <laughs> nice. really feel like Zildjian sounds the best. You like him the best. I do like the sound of Zildjian the best. Yeah. I you can. Know, like I say, everyone's making great gear. Mm -hmm. But, you know, there is the, the sense that the the formula that they use it's been replicated by everybody, but they've got the old pizza ovens in Boston. Now they've got the no, it's kind of a more of a, a high tech mm -hmm. layout, but they still have the old pizza ovens there. So you can see them That's and so cool. You, it's cool. Cause they would just put a blob of, of metal in there. They'd melt it and then they hammer it and polish it and, and figure out the weight and the thinness, et cetera. And uh, they make great gear. And I played them on stage in Philly I was on a four foot riser, which is pretty high for me. It's usually a two foot riser. And my friend out front goes, man, those cymbals sounded great. And I said, yeah, well, I was actually up so high. My cymbals were probably about eight feet up. And everybody could hear them like above, not only the way the PA was delivering them, but the way I think they were delivered to the room was just like not eye level. It was mm -hmm. above your head. And I, you know, it was cool to talk about symbols. I'm happy you brought that up. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. As a, as the daughter of a percussionist, it was the, you know what? No, I need to know. <laughs> That's a good question. All right, Stephen, thank you so much for being on the show with us today. We have enjoyed this so, so much. Very much. So Thanks, where Aaron. can thank our viewers and our listeners find more about you and what you've got coming out? Well, let's see. Uh, if you want to see me and talk to me, it's going to be very hard, but <laughs> You can go to the uh, Stephen Perkins drummer, my IG account, and uh, Stephen Perkins for Twitter. I'm always posting about my favorite drummers and people that turn me on and why. And as far as what's coming up next, those are good places to find out. Jane's Addiction and Porno and my new label. Those will be a little bigger, more uh, social explosion than my little mm -hmm. personal stuff, I guess, in a sense. But I, I appreciate all the love you guys give. And, and all that. So, ba doom ba pa <laughs> I'm okay. <laughs> I cannot think of a better way to end the show. <laughs> All right. That, that may be one awesome. of the coolest things that's ever happened uh, on our show. So thank you. That was very thank awesome. Thank you so much. And have we a great sure afternoon, that, guys. We are going to make sure that we put your Instagram and your Twitter in the episode description so that our viewers can find you. Thank you. And I want to remind everybody, too, that subscribing is the single most important thing that you can do to help us 
continue to grow, continue to get amazing guests, just like Stephen Perkins here today, to have these awesome conversations with to learn so much about what he's done, what he's doing, where he's going for the next 54 years. So please subscribe. It means the absolute most to us, and it helps more than you're ever going to know. And just remember, kids, pop culture, it's all around you. It influences everything you do and in every part of your life. So be sure to come back next week. We're going to have your fix waiting right here for you. Thank you so much, Stephen. It was a pleasure, guys. It went well. That was awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, thanks for listening to Pop Culture Addicts. If you're interested in being a guest on a future episode of Pop Culture Addicts, you can reach us on either Instagram or Twitter by using the handle at PCA Pod Show. You can also email us at PCA Pod Show at gmail.com. Thanks for listening. Copyright 2021 Pop Culture Addicts. Reference to any specific product or entity mentioned on this podcast does not constitute an endorsement or recommendation of by Pop Culture Addicts or any of its sponsors. The views expressed by guests are their own, and their appearance on the program does not imply an endorsement of them or any entity that they represent. If you have any questions about this disclaimer, please contact us via email at PCAPodshow at gmail.com.